Welcome to the Michael Files. I'm Hamilton Pevick. Thank you for your patience as I got my shit together for the much anticipated fourth installment. I deeply appreciate everyone who has gone out of their way to let me know that they enjoy the show. And double thanks to those who don't enjoy the show and still managed some civility. YouTube etiquette requires me to ask you to tap that like button and smash that subscribe. However, it has come to my attention that tap and smash are euphemisms for sex, so do what you want with that. Now on to the top stories. In other medicinal mushroom news, a paper titled In Vivo Production of Psilocybin in E. coli was published in the Metabolic Engineering Journal Elsevier. Scientists have engineered bacteria to produce psilocybin in their cells and poop it out. Now that's what I call some good shit. A ScienceAlert.com article by Michelle Starr reports a team of biochemists led by Andrew Jones and Alexandra Adams of Miami University used metabolic engineering to blow our minds. This is a biosynthesis process that relies on changing cells so they will produce compounds they don't naturally produce. One example of this is bioethanol. A popular bacterium for this process is Escherichia coli. Yes, that is how it is pronounced. E. coli is easy to engineer, prolific, well understood, and has a large and versatile array of genetic tools available for engineering. They introduce psilocybin producing genes from Psilocybe cubensis into the bacterium. Jones said, quote, we are taking the DNA from the mushroom that encodes its ability to make this product and putting it in E. coli. It's similar to the way you make beer through a fermentation process. We are effectively taking the technology that allows for scale and speed of production and applying it to our psilocybin producing E. coli. The E. coli can produce massive amounts of psilocybin, ultimately resulting in a fed batch fermentation study with a production teeter of 1.16 grams per liter of psilocybin. This is the highest psilocybin teeter achieved to date from a recombinant organism. Imagine that, a vat of fermented E. coli with the potency power to make 100 million people go interdimensional. For healing purposes, of course. Now let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsor. We'll be back before you can say Schizostoma Laceratum. Organic whole mushroom dual extract powder. Wild crafted for its antioxidants and melanin. Laboratory tested to ensure potency. High quality certified organic medicinal and functional mushrooms for overall well-being. Welcome back. In other psilocybin news, a laboratory in Oakland, California called Oakland Hyphae just hosted the first ever psilocybin cup, a cultivation competition to see who can grow the most potent psilocybe cubensis. Oakland was the first city in the country to decriminalize magic mushrooms in June of 2019. The psilocybin cup had 64 entrants, but only one winner. The first place winner is the Magic Myco Fam, and they grew a strain called Tidal Wave, which is a penis envy and B plus fusion. You might be wondering how a two strain fusion is even possible? More on that in the next episode. The Magic Myco Fam crushed the competition with a staggering 2.26% per dry gram of psilocybin, almost a full percent more than second place. Cultivar Chip Foresight and his Fuzzy Ball strain came in second, and Black Apple 411 came in third with their vulvalis penis envy. Congratulations to all and thank you for your public service. On a side note, the names of these strains helps one appreciate that there are people out there who consider themselves mycosexual. In still other psilocybin news, Detroit has decriminalized psychedelics, including magic mushrooms. Good for you, Detroit. And Italy is on track to do the same with over half a million signatures collected on a referendum to decriminalize cannabis and magic mushrooms. And the vote is to be held in early 2022. Go Italy, you can do it. As some parts of the world split at their ideological seams, it's nice to know that some places are on the right track. Now let's go outside and check in with our forest correspondent. Welcome back. Thank you for reminding me that I would rather be there. In cultivation news, an American biotechnology company called Mycorrhiza Biotech has successfully inoculated pine saplings with truffles. 
CEO Nancy Roseborough claims co-cropping truffles with loblolly pine can provide growers with an additional $110,000 of income per acre over the truffle production cycle. A cash crop for sure. But these tuber borsii, a fragrant white truffle, are also protecting the forest ecosystem. Loblolly pine forests that are highly mycorrhized have better survival rates against factors such as drought and other weather extremes, something that is even more important when you're monocropping a single pine to get rich on truffles. Mycorrhiza Biotech uses patent-pending micropropagation biotechnology protocols to propagate loblolly pine seedlings inoculated with tuber borsii. Once the mycorrhization is confirmed by DNA test, the process from germination to planting takes between 9 and 12 months. Makes me wish, Loblolly, I had a few acres, Loblolly, and a couple decades, Loblolly, to make it happen, Loblolly. Loblolly. In Applied Mycology News, a paper released in November 2020 titled Reactive Fungal Wearable by Adru Adamansky and Anna Nikolaidu et Alia. The researchers set out to assess the sensing potential of fungal wearables. The research team undertook laboratory experiments on electrical response of a hemp fabric colonized by oyster fungi pleurotus ostriatus to mechanical stretching and stimulation with attractants and repellents. And Amansky says, quote, we have shown that it is possible to discern a nature of stimuli from the fungi's electrical responses, end quote. These results have paved a way towards future design of intelligent sensing patches to be used in reactive fungal wearables. But what does that even mean? GreenQueen.com article by Tanuvi Joe says, quote, To explain this concept further, we use an example of a heart rate monitor, and using the study's findings, the mushroom's perceptions of the environment would become the data that gives you the beats per minute count on this device. Dr. Mohamed Mahdi Deshabi, co-author of the study and researcher with the Universidad Oberta de Catalonia, seen understanding an artificial intelligence lab, said, quote, fungi grow extremely fast and bind to the substrate you combine them with and are even able to process information in a way that resembles computers. We can reprogram a geometry and graph theoretical structure of the mycelium networks and then use the fungi's electrical activity to realize computing circuits. Fungi do not only respond to stimuli and trigger signals accordingly, but also allow us to manipulate them to carry out computational tasks. In other words, to process information." End quote. Mycelium computing? Could that be disruptive to current silicon-based chips? No. The authors of the paper don't mean to replace silicon chips. Fungal reactions are too slow for that. Rather, they think that the findings could help humans use mycelium growing in the ecosystem as a large-scale environmental sensor, as fungal networks are monitoring a large number of data streams as part of their everyday existence. And if we could plug into that mycelial network and interpret the signals they use to process information, individuals could learn more about what was happening in an ecosystem. Where do I plug in? In foraging news, the North American Mycological Association released their executive summary of poisoning report in the March-April 2021 edition of the Mycophile newsletter, authored by Michael W. Bogue, PhD and chair of the Namatoxicology Committee. The report covers poisoning from 2018 to 2020. There were five deaths. One death from muscarine found in Clytocybe species and four deaths from listeria found on contaminated enoki mushrooms. Listeriosis is a serious infection usually caused by eating food contaminated with the bacterium Listeria montocytogens. An estimated 1,600 people get listeriosis each year. For the first time ever, Agaricus bisporus takes first place with the most reported poisonings at nine reported cases. You may know this mushroom as the only one in the store. The strangest poisoning case in the past three years is a very recent case where the patient made a tea from Psilocybe cubensis and injected the tea into his arm. It was a psilocybin microdosing attempt gone horribly wrong. He survived after many days in the intensive care unit, followed by three weeks in the hospital, and he still needs ongoing treatment. Cultures taken from his blood revealed bacterial growth, and get this, Psilocybe cubensis was cultured from his blood raising the question, is he still human? And making his case simultaneously terrifying, intriguing, and stupefying. Let this be a lesson to us all. 
In Mushroom News News, the second incarnation of Fungi Film Fest is on now, and tickets are on sale here. My latest film teaser called Fungos Sanitatum, about people who have or are healing themselves with mushrooms, will be screening at the festival, so don't miss it. There's a new biannual publication out of the UK called Mushroom, and a one-off publication called Mushroom People. And now it's time for the big score. And it goes to a cultivator, Joey Bowler, and his Black King species. Just look at that monster. Well done, Joey. Check out his website here. Please support your local mushroom farmers and forays. Eating mushrooms is good for you, mostly. That's it for this episode of The Mycophiles. Thank you for watching, sharing, liking, commenting, living, breathing, and foraging. Extra special thanks to those who dig their shit pits deep enough. I'm Hamilton Pevick, singing off. What? What?